That's right. That is right. We're back. Oh, it's been way too long. It has been way too long. Oh, my gosh. It's been so long. I totally forgot that I am supposed to be, you know, sporting these bad boys. <laughs> it's during the day. It is right now, Tuesday, August 23rd. Paleocrat Diaries. Ow! I'm super psyched, pumped out of my mind. And why is that? I don't know. It's the kids' first day of school back at Sacred Heart. Sacred Heart Academy begins every single Monday through Friday with the math. And they began today. What an awesome idea. They began today with adoration. Totally amazing. What an amazing school. It's why I do what I do. You can find information down in the description below. You can find that about the Patreon and how you can support that effort, in fact. And then after that, what did I do? I went to St. Alphonsus. This is a redemptorist parish here in town. They've got a grotto, and in that grotto, they've got a pieta. And what did I do there? I took a knee. I took a knee for Christ the King. I resolved deep inside, never give up. Keep on smiling and remember that one day we're gonna die. And I beheld that man, I beheld Our Lady, rededicated to our patroness, Our Lady of Perpetual Help, and I howled at the sun. <laughs> and now we're back. Now we're back, and what are we gonna be doing today? Oh, I don't know. A little something something continuing mystics and messiahs. Man, I got distracted, folks. I did, I was all over the map. I was doing tons of things in this effort, this crazy, crazy drive that I've got that says every single thought, every single word, all of my deeds to Christ the King in total conformity, the best I can with the divine constitution of the church, because that's what we do every single day here. It's what we do. But sometimes it gets me all over the place and I gotta refocus. I gotta finish some projects. And this is the second to last episode of this. Uh, so I hope you've got your coffee. Oh, look at this. <laughs> I hope you've got your coffee ready. Straight to the dome with a straw. You've gotta do it, it's what we do here. Check it out. I've even got the superhero mug because I'm super psyched. Mm. By the way, speaking of super psyched, check this out. I'm right there. Super psyched about this, over here you've got all the different folks that are showing up here in the chat. I'm very grateful for all of you. Ivan, Ivan, you were the first one. Is this true? It says top chat. It says top chat, live chat. Yeah, you're the, bro, Ivan, you are the first one in this house. Normally, normally it would go to somebody else. I think Colin sometimes is first. Sometimes it's Phil. Sometimes, okay. I'm very grateful for all of you. Make sure if you love the show, and I hope you do, okay. I hope you love the show. We do have a crazy fun time, right? I got I to gotta make some kind of a slogan out of the idea that there's great energy and vigor on this show. I know that because Trent Horn said as much. And by the way, thank you very much for that, uh, Trent. It'd be, you know, <laughs> it would be good to talk to you. Like, I mean, just, just legit, right? Just legit. I think, you know, I, I really appreciate what you said. I really appreciate it. And I'm going to make good on it, man. I'm going to make good on it, talking about Trent Horn. He mentioned about uh, the Mohammedans, uh, the Jews, atheists, seeing how the apologetic method advanced on this program, how it would work in the field. Okay, We are going to accommodate the best we can to that because we have a position here regarding debates and mediums. And hey, look, fault me for it, man. You know, Some people went to school for different things. I went to school for journalism and mass comp. So I have a certain theory about mediums and messages and which one, uh, why, we, why we do or do not do what we do with this program and this apostolate. But I appreciate the challenge. And, and it's a good idea too. In fact, it's not just a good idea to create videos particularly dedicated to those topics, um, but, but to pray for them too. And we're gonna begin, we're actually gonna pray. We don't, we don't do this often, right? This is not a professional Catholic show. We do talk about Catholicism, but I've, I'm, I don't like doing that, <laughs> doing the kind of thing that everybody else, you know, they, they kind of begin a certain very solemn way and everything else. And I'm like, look, we're on YouTube. I mean, people have intro music. <laughs> like, I don't know. People, some people take that deadly serious. Um, we take the topics very serious, but we also understand what we're doing. But I think one of the things to understand is that without prayer, it's just a bunch of head and no heart. And that's not right. And so we're going to not just not just try 
to make compelling arguments, right? Arguments mainly directed for the faith of, of the Christian, uh, also to provide a testimony to the reasonability of our faith, uh, but also, most importantly, to provide a witness even in and of ourselves. And I think one of those ways to do it, of course, is to pray. And so I'm very grateful for all of you. But if you love this show and, and you love what we do and you don't get enough, right? You're kind of grumpy. You're all sorts of you're all sorts of upset, just <laughs> all bummed out because there's just not enough shows. If that's the case, make sure check out the description below. You can find ways to get deeper, real deep, not the kiddie pool, not the kiddie pool. We're talking the deep end, ocean level, sea 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 deep there. Okay, and that is over at the Wolfpack chat, and we're gonna be doing more there, of course, as well. So make sure to check all of that out. Again, very grateful for. All of you. Um, before we even move on, before we uh, actually, you know what? No, we're gonna we're gonna show real quick the same maker promo. Uh, once we get through it with the same maker promo, we'll we'll pray right after this. So make sure make sure that you're you're good and you're good and worked up. Right? <laughs> make sure you've got that straw so that you can bypass the blood brain barrier with that caffeine. That's how it's the jet fuel here. Mm. That's the jet fuel. And so that's how we have the energy and vigor of the show. That, and it's a little bit of your boy here. <laughs> and if I haven't introduced myself, Jeremiah Bannister, I'm sorry about that. Oh, it's at the bottom of the screen. Check that out. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. So, yeah. I, who put that there? <laughs> oh, that was me. So, yeah. Make sure to check out all that stuff. Uh, also, of course, check out The Same Maker. And this is something I want to do better about. Right? It's something that um, I really want to do better about the... Not just the morning prayers, right? Like the priest at our at our church, uh, one of them. We have a number of them, but one of them, he always says, you know, you got your your morning and your midday prayers, you've got your evening prayers, and you've got your meal times. Okay, so he's talk. He uses his hand and he talks about the various times of the day that you should be praying. Okay, including you know Angelus and other things like that. And so I want to do better about that. I want to be more consistent about praying in the prayer chain, not just not just accepting that a lot of other people do, but that I want to get back to doing that. It was awesome today, by the way, to pray in that grotto. It was really awesome. It was awesome to just be there, to be part of a large group of people that are, that are uh, rededicating themselves, pledging their allegiance in their hearts, right? And in their minds to Our Lady of Perpetual Help. It was totally awesome. And, and But just to get more involved in that and to emphasize it, because we, we talk about that all the time. We talk about the, the role of piety, the role of devotion, right? To live a truly devout life and in the centrality of prayer. Uh, but sometimes isn't it easy to kind of fade away from that a little bit and find yourself really, you know, being busy, a busy body with other things and feeling like maybe you don't have the time for that? And yet you make time. Isn't it also interesting that when you do that, I know it's true for me, when I do that, I always end up finding myself at the end of the day, if I did an examination of conscience and I really did that and I was consistent with that, which is part of the saint maker, you'll learn more about that in a second, that, that if I was doing that properly, I would realize the enormous amounts of time that I spend doing other things instead of praying. Instead of praying. And it's tragic. And I think maybe that's one of the reasons why I, I am reluctant at times maybe to do examinations of conscience is because I'm sitting there. I'm like, well, I don't even want to think about how my day went. I didn't make the best decisions in the use of my time. I didn't do the best that I possibly could. You know, and the same maker helps with that. And it's going to help with all of the different projects that I've done. If I would have done a little bit better with that. I think I would have <laughs> completed some of the some of the series that I did. I, I we did not finish this. We got we we went on a wild a wild rabbit trail, which was awesome. Of apologetics, totally awesome. We started uh, devout life. We did uh, nihilism, but we have I think two more chapters of that. I still haven't finished the episode, <laughs> the, the the essay done by Colin. I need to wrap that bugger up. And that way, I've, I've already set up playlists. I've heard the outcry. And so all those playlists are going to be, they're going to be uh, just bursting with material. Because I've created, I think there's like 10 different ones, different books that we've done, different topics that we cover, and all of that's going to be available. But I have to be able 
to organize my life and structure my life in such a way that it's like those old medieval towns and villages where everything around it, you've got the church at the center. And then you've got around that, you've got the businesses and the business district. And, and it, around that, you've got the farms. And then on the edges, you've got your, your monks and your nuns and the like, <laughs> you know? And so you have to structure your days that way, especially when you're trying to be a baller, when you're trying to do the best you can, right? Planting seeds left and right, being the Johnny Appleseed of the Catholic faith. When you're doing stuff like that, you've got to get yourself in order. And one of the great ways in order to do that, of course, is with the saint maker. We'll be back in 90 seconds. Yeah. Can a personal planner really make you a saint? Not by itself. But in our day and age of addictive apps and glowing screens, we're bombarded by constant distraction. And our quest for sainthood often takes a backseat. The Saint Maker is the first high-performance planner for the spiritual life made by faithful Catholics for faithful Catholics. It's a work of genius, really, fusing the wisdom of the saints with the science of personal productivity. It's rigorous, but sainthood is tough, and most of us need help organizing our time, our work, our leisure, and our devotion, because that can help you become a saint. The Saint Maker is elegant, fits in your purse or briefcase, and is a perfect companion for your missal, Bible, or rosary. Published four times per year, each season includes daily planning pages, feast days, and devotions for both forms of the liturgical calendar, goal-setting pages, confession journals, and more. It's why the Saint Maker is used by hardworking Catholics like CEO of Sock Religious Scott Williams, best-selling author Sam Guzman, YouTubers like Amber Schneider, a Catholic wife Dina Barca, and Brian Holdsworth, and priests like Father Corey Stitcher. Try the Saint Maker out, and if you decide that it's not for you, you can send it back for a full refund within 90 days. So go right now. Find your life planner at thesaintmaker.com. Quantities are limited, though, so head on over to thesaintmaker.com to order yours and to start your Saint Maker journey today. You got to do it. Saintmaker.com slash Pillycrad Diaries. Uh, I hope you've got that coffee. Because you're going to need it right now because that is the Paleocrat Diaries alert system. That is letting everybody know all around the world that we are on the air. It is the Tuesday, August 23rd edition of Paleocrat Diaries. Started off the day awesome. I hope you did too. I hope you got on your knees and you cried out to God, howling at the sun, thanking him, rejoicing in fact, being glad in your heart for yet another day. Because it's the day that the Lord has made. And we rejoice here. We are not ashamed to rejoice. There's great energy. There's great vigor <laughs> on this show. And we're rocking it out. And we're doing it with a heart of prayer, right? Our minds totally aflame for God, saying, renew us always. Renew us. Renew us in our hearts through prayer. Renew us in our bodies through disciplines. And renew us, of course, in our mind through your word, through the truth that comes through tradition from the saints, from the scriptures, from the readings of the mass, right? All the prayers and all the great conversations that we have and some really great apostolates too. Some people doing amazing work out there, putting themselves out, right? Doing the best they can with what they've got and trying their best in these really trying times to give it every single thought, every single word, every single deed for him because he reigns right now. King of Kings, Lord of Lords right now. So get psyched. We're going to be talking today, mystics and messiahs, death cults, <laughs> suicide cults. Is it true, though? Is it true? Is it a sui Are they suicide cults, all of them? Are they death cults? And the death cults, is it always suicide? Or sometimes, is it homicide? And is it homicide sometimes by authorities? We're going to learn about that. And we're going to be praying for a whole bunch of folks coming up here in a couple seconds. So break out that guitar right now. Break out that, that keytar, <laughs> the xylophone, the didgeridoo, the harpsichord, everything you've got, <laughs> and just blast it out. <laughs> that way everybody in the world, north, south, east, and west, that they get pumped up for the king of kings, that for the advancement of, the, uh, of Christendom in this world, for the advancement of the cause of Christ in every single area of our lives. So let your friends know right now, friends, classmates, coworkers, all of them, even your frenemies and your family too. You gotta let them know. You gotta let them know that this is what you do. <laughs> Isn't it true? Isn't it true? All right. Now, 
Now that we've gotten that out of the way, super psyched, okay? Time to wind down for a second. Time to get serious. And I'm being very serious about this, okay? This is a manual of devotions. It's, in fact, quite old. Um, what year was this? I think it was 1930 or something like that. It's quite old. It's got really cool, really cool art in it, too. Yeah, 1938. New York, Feast of the Sacred Heart. Look at that, right? Isn't God good? Isn't God good? So in there, there is a particular prayer that's been really meaningful to me. And it was really meaningful to me for reasons that I talked about in great detail um, in the heartfelt series that we did on Monsignor Ronald Knox's magnum opus entitled Enthusiasm, where it goes through and it talks about the various enthusiasms, when people take something that's a good a good thing maybe, and they take it way too far. And it becomes a defining characteristic of them and their movement to the detriment of their souls and the detriment of souls all around them. I grew up that way. I grew up an enthusiast, right? And, I, and it's something that always pops its ugly head every once in a while. <laughs> it still does. And you got to deal with it. It's just part of who we are. We get excited about something. We're hobby horse enthusiasts. Right? We get on that hobby horse and just ride it till the break of dawn. And so we have to be good about it. We've got to be, we've got to be on guard against those things. And, and, but I wasn't. And I fell away from the faith for a long time, for seven years. I only recently, it was last year, that during the during this show, that I surpassed, as a Catholic, the number of years in the church that I spent as an atheist. Okay? Next up is, is Calvinism. That was 10 years. Okay? That's going to be toast by the end of my life. But to, to get back to the core of things, to say, when I came back, you know, I, I, had, I had gotten this before I had become a set of a contest, and that was before being an atheist. If you'd like to know more about that story, uh, there's a, a video here on Meaning of Catholic, one of the very first ones, I think it was episode four, the fourth video ever on this channel uh, tells that story. And so, but I, when I came back, you know, I was, I was a wreck. I was a wreck. I didn't even know where my heart was in things. And, you know, I, I remember I grabbed the, the little flower chaplet. I brought it to church and I grabbed this. I'd, I'd kept it. You know, I like, I like old books. Even when I was an atheist, I, yeah, I didn't read it. I, didn't, I definitely didn't pray it, but I kept it. And when I came back, I was really, really glad that I did. Because in here, there is a particular prayer. And the prayer is called the act of reparation to the most blessed sacrament. And I want to dedicate this year, as I said, it's my kid's first day of school. They had uh, uh, adoration, which was totally amazing. And beautiful mass, right? You had two priests there. You had, you had a deacon there. Absolutely beautiful. The, the Gregorian chant was there. It was amazing. A, a bunch of altar boys, right? Wonderfully vested. It was awesome. And, and I thought about it. And I said, what an amazing way to start their school year. How strategic is that? And I figured, you know, it's kind of one of those things, you know, I, I, I don't like really treating New Year as a new year for me. That's not really when I even reflect on the year that's passed. That happens in uh, July, okay? That happens during what we call our triduum here in our family. Uh, three, three very tragic days in a row, or within a week span. And during that time, I think a lot about the past and the future and stuff. But I think I'm going to tether and tie this to the reason I'm doing the show, and that is that I'm doing it for my kids. I said, that's the, the thing that started it, was saying, I want to send my kids to this school. And I knew that I needed to do extra work. We didn't make enough. So I needed to do even more work than I'd been doing so that we could somehow provide. And God has been really good. You've been awesome, by the way. I appreciate all of it. And when I, when I was at church today, I got this out and I, I hadn't prayed this in a while. And... To be honest, it was, it was hard because I had realized that over the years since I've come back, that it's been easier and easier to forget the centrality of this particular prayer and how it's been alive in my heart, why, what, how significant it was and what it meant to me. And, and yet through the work that I do here, and you'll understand as we pray, this really is the heart of, of even what we're doing here. And so I'm asking you if you'd pray with me. You know, if you're driving, don't close your eyes. <laughs> don't do that. But if you can, do it. 
and pray with me. In nomine Patris, et Filii, Spiritus Sancti. Amen. With that most profound respect, which divine faith inspires, O my God and Savior, Jesus Christ, true God and true man, I adore thee, and with my whole heart I love thee, hidden in the most august sacrament of the altar. In reparation for all the irreverences, profanations, and sacrileges that I, to my shame, may have until now committed, as also for all those that have been committed against thee, or that may be ever committed for the time to come. I offer to thee, therefore, O my God, my humble adoration, not indeed such as thou art worthy of, nor such as I owe thee, but such at least as I am capable of offering. And I wish that I could love thee with the most perfect love of which rational creatures are capable. In the meantime, I desire to adore thee now and always, not only for those Catholics who do not adore or love thee, but also to supply the defect and for the conversion of all heretics, schismatics, libertines, atheists, blasphemers, sorcerers, Mohammedans, Jews, and idolaters. Ah, yes, my Jesus, mayest thou be known, adored, and loved by all. And may thanks be continually given to thee in the most holy and august sacrament. Amen. In nomine Patris, et Filii, Spiritus Sancti. Amen. The reason that's the heart of it is because I've been a couple different things in that list. Heretic, schismatic, libertine, atheist, blasphemer, idolater. I was many of those things. And when I came back, I sat there and I thought, how many sacrileges, profanations, how many? And the defect. The defect, we, we look out and we see You know, so many people right now falling away, falling prey to all sorts of nonsense, to all sorts of of wickedness and depravity. There's a huge defect and it's easy to get cynical. It's easy to get cynical and and to to just chalk it up as a, a, a useless cause. Worthless, not worth our time, not worth our energy, not worth the emotion the money that we may have to invest, just simply not worth it. But I'm glad that there were people that when I was among those who were guilty of those very things, when I was guilty of those very things, that there were people out there who refused to believe that about me. I want to provide the defect. And I hope that people will do that for me because there's times when I don't fully live up to what I'm supposed to do. And so I'm really grateful for all of you. I'm grateful for all of you that we can, that we can march forward in this, in this great endeavor, in this really, truly awesome apostolate. I love it. I know it's mine, (laughs) but it's not mine. For one, it's my family's, but it's not even ours. It's the Lord's. It's the Lord's. And so I'm really grateful for the opportunity. And I hope that you are too. Now, getting back to this. <laughs> getting back to this. Oh, yes, and that is the reparation of the sacred heart. Uh, uh, um, no, not reparation of the sacred heart. Um, uh, that is reparation to the most blessed sacrament. The most blessed sacrament. I'll post that at the Wolfpack chat. I'll post it after the show. Okay? Now, we are going to, for a couple different reasons, we're actually going to skip over a really, really important cult. And that's the Branch Davidians of Waco. We're not going to skip over them entirely. We'll get, we'll get back to them. But there's things that I want to want to review. For one, I actually want to see the series. I've heard good reviews of the series. I want to re- refresh myself on some of the relevant materials, some videos that impacted my understanding of it. Uh, the complex difficulties that came out as the story developed over time. And instead, we're going to skip over that. We'll get back to it. We're skipping over Waco for a second. And we're going to move on to a couple different groups here. Okay. About doomsday cults. Let me see here. 
We'll give this as, as at least a preface. From the end of the 1980s, there were several reported cases of polygamous messiahs with apocalyptic expectations who carried out violent acts against either disciples or rivals. In 1988, the followers of a Mormon polygamist killed by police uh, retaliated by bombing a Utah church. Also from the fundamentalist Mormon tradition was Jeffrey Lundgren whose followers carried out the sacrificial killings of several suspected traitors within the group in 1989. Did you know about that, by the way? I didn't know that. <laughs> That's one of those things. I, well, I mean, I, I'd read it in here, but I mean, before having read this book, I was, un, I was unaware of that particular thing. The polygamous commune founded by Canadian cult leader, is it, is it Rock uh, Theralt? Is that how you pronounce that last name? I've seen, I've seen the movie Savage Messiah. That's a wild, wild ride. Uh, yeah, it, maybe that maybe that's one of those that we can show at the Wolfpack, or we can do on. We have a Discord stream for for kind of a, a movie theater, and maybe we can do that over there. But that particular one in Canada ended in scandal in 1989 after one of his wives died. Uh, in fact, during his attempt to perform brutal amateur surgery, I saw that there's another uh, a video, and I wish I remember the girl's name offhand. She does a lot of this like true crime stuff and she likes talking a lot about whether it's serial killers and stuff like that, but also cults, okay? I, if I remember right, she not only did one on this particular guy, Savage Messiah guy, but also one on Mother God. <laughs> yeah. Mother God is dead, um, you know, and I, you don't want to dance around that or anything. But the truth is, I mean, it's the, we'll talk about that too. That, that's, a, that's an interesting one because it was an internet cult. I mean, she, it was a strange kind of internet sensation. I, I, it, it's bizarre. The whole story is bizarre. The stuff that they would do and the way that they, they've kind of floundered now and they've like spiraled out of control. I guess that happens when, you know, the goddess of the universe dies and stuff. Yeah, you end up like, you know, going in a bazillion different directions and everybody's like, no, I've got the real truth now. And so they're all doing that sort of thing. Predictable, right? Super predictable. Also exposed at this time was the Yahweh sect in Florida, a Messianic black Jewish group, which was involved in at least a dozen murders, as well as widespread financial criminality. These affairs were dwarfed by four incidents occurring between 1993 and 1997. The 90s were a hopping hop time for cults, for death cults, right? Due worldwide attention. You had the siege of the Branch Davidian Group, Waco, Texas, as February to March 1993. The violence linked to the Order of the Solar Temple in Switzerland, France, and Canada in 1994 and 1995. And we'll talk more. I'll, I'll do I'll do videos probably about each one of these groups that we're going to mention because each one of those stories are just insane. And there's actually there's actually a weird set of a contest kind of connection with the uh, the Order of the Solar Temple kind of a weird thing or the rad tratty thing, right? In which 70 members perished. The terrorist attacks, right? It was a, is it um, uh, Shinrikyo? How would you pronounce that? Yeah, the move, it was a movement. It included nerve gas attacks on a Tokyo subway. That's another one. There's some really good videos that I have on my, on my playlist to, to watch. Some documentaries that they did. If I remember right, didn't they have a bunch of music? Which one was there? It was Children of God, right? Is that what it was? There was a there was a group that had all these music videos, and actually, there's so, there are a couple of the music videos. I was like, yeah, that's not too bad, actually. It's not too bad. <laughs> it was. I look. You know, I was like, man, that's hopping. That's good. That's real good. <laughs> and Heaven's Gate, right? There was an incident in San Diego in which 39 believers killed themselves. That was March 1997. These episodes claimed over 200 lives. Right. So, now one of the one of the things, and we'll learn we'll learn more about this in the Waco the Waco series, but that uh, the Waco video. Um, one of the problems when it comes to these these cults, the more extreme ones like this, right, that end up having crazy reactions, is um, the occasional problem that is exacerbated by a trust of the experts. And by the experts, we mean government, 
right? You know, law officials, law, the authorities, stuff like that. But also, also experts that come in from uh, deprogramming, right? Anti-cult movements, in fact. So the anti-cultists, a lot of times, end up causing enormous amounts of trouble. Trouble that later on, they realize the whole thing was a joke. Kind of like the experts that happened during the satanic panic. A lot of those were uh, these kind of people wanting to, wanting to draw out the memories, wanting to use dreams and memories in order to recover them from your childhood, using all sorts of you know, strange techniques, including hypnotism. Later being, you know, kind of exposed and saying, look, many different studies to say, can you guys retrieve this stuff or not? Come to find out, well, you can't. Wow, that's weird. You just led people by the nose for like a long time on a whole bunch of stuff, scaring everybody in the world that there's some group outside the door looking at all your kids, wanting to wrangle them up to kill them. in some weird ritual. And that's not to say nothing like that ever happened. We'll talk about the satanic panic as well. But the truth is, you know, that, that, it gets fueled. It's kind of like, what were there problems with Waco? Undoubtedly so. Undoubtedly so. Was he? Was he? Was it completely innocent? Well, no. But at the same time, did it? Did it warrant what happened to them? No way. That's, that's just a foretaste. Truth is, no way. No way, Jose. including, by the way, and I'll, I'll end it with this right here, says, uh, it says, although a contemporary audience probably will not dispute the right of an individual to join the most authoritarian and exploitative cult, cult opponents are more effective when they shift the grounds of their assault to those members who cannot give such full consent. In particular, children, teenagers, that are recruited or assaulted by a particular group to quote one immediate justification for the assault of Waco, and we can even say others, extrapolate that to say others, quote, babies were being beaten. After Waco, James R. Lewis suggested that we should be at least as concerned about the implications of the quote, destructive anti-cult as about the quote, destructive cults that they denounce. I wish this wasn't so, but it's, but I'm glad in a way, I'm glad we figured this out because one of the ideas that I had for this was that whenever we're talking about, whether we're talking about enthusiasms, whether we're talking about heresies or schisms, whether we're talking about other uh, schools of uh, philosophical, theological, political, sociological, and cultural thought, no matter what, that we're going to try really hard not to just take this position where, where you're simply reading your buddies talking about them, but actually saying, well, let's go and actually look. Because sometimes, sometimes some of the things that are said by people on our side end up causing enormous amounts of problems. Enormous. And Waco's one of them. Waco's one of them. And not the only one. It's also, of course, why I had to get rid of my He-Man toys. <laughs> I'm never going to get over that. <laughs> I'm never going to get over it. I, I I wondered before, you know, there was a kid named Gabriel that I had to give those to in school. I've said it before. Gabriel was like the cool guy. He looked cool. He looked like he had money. He wasn't wearing the, the really thick corduroy pants like I was that you had to cuff like 20 times. And it looked like inner tubes at the bottom of your baggy pants. He didn't have that. He didn't have that. He had a nice home. <laughs> he, he had a, his parents had a nice car. He had a nice haircut. I had one of those, you know, painter boy haircuts, which are cool enough. But, you know, I, but I had to give all my He-Man toys to that guy. And why? Because of experts. Experts who, who turn out being some crazy weirdo who goes around calling himself an apostle. Well, not the book. The book wasn't written by that guy, right? What, what is it called? Is it is it Turmoil in the Toy Box? So not the author, the propagator, the one that got him on TV and had it spread all over the place. That dude, that dude is a new thought metaphysician. He is a magician <laughs> thinking those weird thoughts going out into the universe, believing that you can tap into the positive and the negative side of the Lord in order to create your reality. Yeah, just close your eyes and think about it a lot. 
and use word capsules that are filled with faith. Yeah. Experts. Experts. The image of mass suicide proved decisive. The media were already citing Jonestown precedent in the first reports of the February shootout. We'll also talk about Jonestown. The whole concept of mass suicide is a relatively late addition to the cult stereotype, though it had rapidly become an integral component. As time suggested after the Heaven's Gate affair, quote, suicide cults have entered the category of horrors that no longer qualify as shocks. That is frightening. (laughs) <laughs> isn't that isn't that frightening by the way totally we've gotten to a place where we're so inundated by sensationalism in large part because the media and the media the media ends up time and time and time again being worse for the whole situation in dealing with cults worse than than anti-cultists they they give the anti-cultists a lot of times the megaphone For the most bizarre and sensational things, not the most nuanced things, not the most realistic things or scholarly things, where people have truly investigated something, but the kind of thing that's rooted in suspicion, scandal, sensationalism, that sells. Sex sells. Media gobbles it up. Gobbles it up. This charge virtually never appears in earlier cult scares. Not in the time of the Mormons, not in the time of the early black Muslims, the I Am movement, or any of the older militant movements. Though obviously, the snake handlers of the 1940s were facing a high risk of, you know, injury and such. Yeah, they they were, they were definitely, hold on. Yeah, they were definitely, (laughs) yeah, so it wasn't a death call per se, but they're at least always opening themselves up to the possibility that they are going to be, you know, dead. Now, the mass suicide notion had ancient origins in the context of fanatical groups like the Jewish rebels at Masada and the Circumcellions in the Roman North Africa. By the way, if you'd like to know more about the Circumcellions, we talked about them in the Enthusiasm series. That's, the, that's a wild ride. That's during the Donatist controversy. Okay? So during the Donatist controversy, a lot of it had to do with, with martyrdom. And the Circumcellions were the radical group. They were like the brown, the brown shirts of the Donatists, right? Donatism, the, the leaders of it, they, it's like they didn't want to deal with them, but they also knew that that was an important faction, an important wing. So they would kind of distance themselves, but never fully condemn. They were... They were Kind of uh, controlled opposition, right? Or not, not controlled opposition, but they were, they were, they were, they were lackeys, right? They were the extreme lackeys. And by extreme, I mean the kind of folks that roll up to you with a club with a bunch of nails on it, threatening to, you need to kill them or they're going to kill you. <sighs> you better kill me right now. And you're like, wow, what? And you're like, if you don't kill me, I'm going to kill you. Put yourself in that person's shoes for a minute. You're like, I'm just going to buy a sandwich. <laughs> what, what am I doing here? I don't want to kill anybody. If you don't kill me, I'm going to kill you, buddy. They were serious. Them dudes were not playing around. It was this latter and relatively obscure reference, not obscure for people who are attuned to Philocrat Diaries, that gave rise to the first American reference to a mass cult suicide, which appeared in a 1955 mystery story by Edward D. Hawk. His, he had a village of the dead, tells a bizarre cult of a bizarre cult formed in a Western town by a leader named Exodus. Is it Exodus? The prophet. Who persuades his 70 or so followers to kill themselves en masse by throwing themselves over a cliff. It also happened to be the name of the historical leader of the Circumcellions, who is being imitated by the fictional uh, modern day cult leader in Village of the Dead. Now I got to watch Village of the Dead. <laughs> now I got it. Is, is it a movie at this point? Village of the Dead. Or is it just a book? A mystery story. All right. Well, he just gave it away. It's a mystery. Oh, man. <laughs> now I already know. Philip Jenkins, you jerk. You should have put spoiler alert on there, man. <laughs> 
The first actual event of this kind, the Jonestown Affair in 1978, that's, that's a bummer. 1978 was an otherwise awesome year. Ya boy was born. Owed nothing to such religious influences, but derived from new left political rhetoric. Jim Jones admired the Black Panthers, who espoused what Huey Newton termed revolutionary suicide. The doctrine that a hopeless struggle against overwhelming odds would detonate mass revolutionary action. The Panthers were in turn influenced by an Algerian anti-colonial struggle in the 1950s, and that's reflected in the revolutionary film, The Battle of Algiers. So, so you have a situation where there may be a lot of people right now that when they think about Jonestown, their immediate thought is that it is uh, religious, not so much political, that there was this kind of religious dynamic. And there was. I mean, there's no doubt that you see a fusion of these things together. But it was definitely involved with the politics of the new left. Although the idea was new in 1978, stereotypes of, and by the way, preface, the idea of social imaginary, like what's already entered into your mind about groups and about reality and about how things work or how people behave. And so when you say, well, where did this idea come from that fueled these kinds of scares and the way that we described these, these kinds of groups, right? this type of group, um, what, what preceded that? What ended up uh, uh, laying the groundwork and providing the soil wherein these new ideas would be given birth? Stereotypes of blind obedience, disregard of self and family, violent tendencies, a preparedness to follow any orders issued by a deranged Messiah. The idea became so well established that soon, Mass suicide seemed a probable outcome of cult extremism. So people, it had gotten to the point where people started just thinking, oh, you're in a cult, mass suicide's next. But most of these groups, in fact, all of them, were not involved in that. Except for, you know, <laughs> uh, Jews at a particular time. And they were, they were fleeing from Romans. And on the other hand, you have the Circumcellions fueled by some crazy thing going on down in, in Africa during the early times of the church. Following persecution, by the way, where a bunch of their buddies were martyred, maybe even family members martyred because they wouldn't give up scrolls. And then a flip of the switch and the empire changes and the church officially allows those who had refused to give up their life, allowed them to come back, even allowed some of them to become bishops. There's some trauma mixed up in that. You have to at least sympathize. The image of cult suicide was reinforced, right, by, by this phrase, the doomsday cult. Though the doomsday term originally implied that a group was obsessed with the idea of apocalypse, it became subtly transformed to describe movements uh, like the one in Japan that was was gassing everybody left and right, right, which undertook armed violence or revolutionary action in order to provoke the end times. In some weird ways, you have that sort of thing going on with dispensational premillennialism. And by that, all I mean really is the kind of rapture fever that you hear with folks like John Hagee. Folks like that. You turn on the TV and you see a dude wearing a bunch of gold rings and fancy suits. And he has a massive mansion talking all the time about planting the seed of money and all of that and, and claiming to have miracles left and right with a bunch of people in crutches. You've never seen so many people in crutches in your life. <laughs> you know, walking around, click, 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 click. Gotta get myself to the revival service. And that way I don't need to use these crutches no more. That kind of, that kind of thing. Those folks... Dispensational premillennialism, right? That's that is in it's another newer idea, 1830s. That's when you've got what the Plymouth Brethren. You got Schofield, like the Study Bible. Okay, you have those those groups that are advancing this idea of a rapture, in impending it, it, that, that it's imminent. You don't know when it could happen. Right now, boom. Boing, and all of a sudden, everybody's gone. Zoink, they're out, and planes are flying. And cars are hitting stuff, and trains are 
flying into everything. Yeah, that. But the terminology made possible a kind of grim comedy of errors in which official expectations would lead a sect to become more paranoid and defensive, which would in turn cause even more official nervousness and intervention. There are, there are few limits to the force that can be levied against any group once it has been designated a doomsday cult. A self-fulfilling title, if ever there was one, invoking the specter of mass suicide almost ensures that maths, mass deaths will ensue. Yeah. It, so yeah, imagine, I mean, if, if let's say you, you have a position, and this is something people got to think about. When we talk about somebody who is a doomsday cult, you say there's a lot of people that would describe a lot of traditional Catholics that way and say, well, you believe that the end is nigh. You believe that we're living in the last days. You believe that we're living in the apostasy. Are you going to go out and murder everybody? Are you going to go out and commit mass suicide? And you say, well, I know I'm not going to do that. But that's the same logic. It's based on doomsday. Doomsday is a very popular thing. In fact, almost every group in the world, even atheist people, you want to you see the atheist doomsday? Turn on TV and look for anything that involves meteorites and stuff that are going to smash into the planet and kill all of us. Or global warming, dun, 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 dun. and it's like, oh my gosh, you know, you know the sea, the, you know the 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 sea coming in, destroying everything, all the animals dying left and right. That's apocalypse now. People who say, oh, we got seven years left, ah! that kind of stuff. I mean, that's like right out of a Jehovah's Witness watchtower. The kind of crazy, weird stuff you see there. In fact, doesn't it seem weird like that? <laughs> that? Like, if you look at the propaganda, the art, the style of art, I've never been a fan of that um, <laughs> just from a perspective of art and stuff. But, you know, to to look at it and, and see the way the cities are on fire and maybe there's some comets and meteorites and stuff coming down and everything and, like, people walking up and they're all super diverse. You got, like, the, the cornucopia of people. Right, maybe even holding themselves one with a bunch of vegetables and fruits and stuff, all dressed in in kind of uh, socially and nationally ethnically diverse attire, all smiling as they're walking away from the fire and brimstone coming down, destroying everything. It, it does remind me a lot of what atheists kind of you know <laughs> love watching about their own scary version of apocalypse now, and it makes sense because if there's no such thing as God's divine providence, if there's no teleological direction and meaning of history or uh, design that God is not sovereign and not providentially overseeing this planet, anything like that, why wouldn't you be afraid? It could happen today. You never know. You never know. We could turn on the TV and go, oh my gosh, we're all dead, guys. We're all dead. It's all over. And some of those weirdos would be like, yes, finally. Finally, the, the humans are gone. How is that not a death call? <laughs> that might actually be a death call. It is a death call. What are we talking about? That's, that's a legit one. With actual plans and stuff like that of population control. <laughs> All of that. But yet those folks are the ones that get away with running the show when it comes to authorities medically, psychologically, legislatively, with law enforcement, in the court systems, everything else, that kind of crowd, that kind of crowd with that particular worldview, that is a death call. <laughs> the Waco precedent shaped public reaction to the diverse doomsday cults, ironically perhaps, because conventional Christian apocalyptic belief had little or nothing to do with the later groups. Heaven's Gate, remains the only authenticated case of occult mass suicide on American soil. That's at the time of this writing, right? And the ideology driving this group was concocted from New Age ideas and UFO speculation with a little dash here and there, maybe two tiny scoops, right? Like the, the ones that you have in the, the little things of sugar, little eats or scoops, right? Of, of Christianity mixed in. 
That was when leadership of Marshall Applewhite and Betty Lou Nettles, who respectively took the names of Bo and Peep, right, that they incorporated some biblical teachings. It was mainly Pete, right, but she ended up dying, right? Or Applewhite, yeah, though after Applewhite died in 1985, her New Age approach remained unchallenged. During the 1970s and 80s, the followers of Bo and Peep increasingly developed the structures of a cult. They formed a communal family, required strict regimentation of daily activities. They fell under Gnostic influence. Leaders declared the body a troublesome vehicle. So much, by the way, so much, by the way, that the, uh, which should be shed in order to achieve a higher state of existence or consciousness. So to them, they're like, look, the shell of the human body is wicked bad. It's holding us down. We cannot achieve the height that we need to. And so what do you need to do? You got to get rid of that bugger. You got to get rid of it. And that way you can ascend. You can you can reach the heights. And but they weren't just going to do that. There was something they had to, you know, kind of throw out there first. And that idea was the devoted male followers accepting surgical castration. <laughs> so they had to be like, oh, what? Can you imagine the day that was pitched? Yeah, yeah, boys, um, come here real quick. Just the guys. I only need the guys. Um, so here's the deal. I've been thinking a lot about this. Um, we are going to get rid of our bodies. But before we do, um, how about the down there? I think that's a good idea. I'd be like, bro, <laughs> What? I don't know about that. Where'd you get that idea from, man? I, that's a bad one. Can you imagine more people being a little bit more serious about that than the idea of just, you know, offing themselves all the way? <laughs> In case they change their mind. I mean, if you, you take your life, it's over, right? You're not going to change your mind about that. I, you won't be able to do anything about it. You know, however, with this, what if you did this and then you realize later, you're like, oh, this is garbage. You do that and then you find out, wow, man, this whole time I've been duped by a weirdo. Been duped by a guy who's out of his mind. Cuckoo crazy. Loon tune. And now what do you got? It's like those those hats that you get. You know, I uh, I went down to Florida and all I came back was this trucker cap. I joined I joined Heaven's Gate and all I came back with was, you know, one less, you know, yeah. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Got to make a hat for that cat. Oh. The group, of course, moved to uh, Rancho Santa Fe, a mansion in San Diego. It advocated its views through the internet. A crisis developed in 1997, the approach of the spectacular Hale-Bopp Comet. This was believed to be concealing an alien starship. Do you catch the vision on that, by the way? Do you fetch, do you <laughs> fetch, do you catch the vision? You're like, oh, look. You know, look at it. You got a comment up. And you're like, oh, this is going to be spectacular. It's amazing. And somebody's like, by the way, I think there's a spaceship back there. I can imagine people want to do that. Might be, this might be true. You never know. I mean, it's probably like using it as a cloaking device or something. That way we're all like looking at it, but yet we're not really looking at it because it's behind it. It's kind of hidden and stuff. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can imagine some guy. You know, still a little tender and stuff, saying, dude, that's the guy that told us, you know. <laughs> and they're like, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, this is getting worse. But somebody noticed. They thought it'd be a good idea. And eventually they killed themselves. They chose to escape the confines of planet Earth by taking phenobarbital and alcohol. Crazy cocktail. It's debatable whether the Heaven's Gate movement was motivated by any distinctively religious motive as opposed to pseudoscience or just straight out science fiction. It had little to do with any known apocalyptic tradition. Other so-called doomsday groups were equal, equally removed from Christian apocalyptic writing. Yeah. Om Shinrikyo offered a bizarre synthesis of Hinduism and Buddhism with some trace Christian elements. The solar temple was perhaps the strangest instance of all. It combined occult and Rosicrucian beliefs with an interest in homeopathic medicine and ecology. 
People be surprised, actually, by, you know, radical groups' interest in ecology. I'm serious. You know, not, just, not just the weirdos in, like, the deep green movement and stuff, right? NCIV and all that. But, but even, you know, uh, Al-Qaeda. Yeah. Osama bin Laden. That dude... He was he was he was all sorts of upset about various various things having to do with the environment. The Kyoto Agreement and stuff. Yeah, he was he was all sorts of he was real angry about. It. Let's see. But they were into home, yeah, homeopathic stuff, homeopathy, in that medicine. So they were like, well, you were, you, you know. <laughs> Okay, so they're like really into essential oils, right? <laughs> like, is that what this is? Solar Temple? None of these strands has historically been associated with violence or suicidal impulses. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of hard to imagine. You know, I, when, I guess when I talk to people who are selling, you know, like young living and stuff, you know, there might be criticisms of certain things, but I'm not imagining that it's like some death cult. I'm like, oh, they want everybody dead. That's what it is. Yeah, but the movement of that, the, the movement leader for the, the Solar Temple, and we'll talk a lot more about this about those guys, um, was fascinated with the martyred Knights Templar of the 14th century. Under their leadership, it was it was two guys all together. It was uh is it is it Juret and Joseph de Mambro? The Solar Temple possessed perhaps 500 members in Europe and North America. October 1994, there was a discovery of over 50 bodies in Switzerland and Canada. More deaths would follow over the next three years. The interpretation of the Solar Temple deaths remains controversial. And why is that? Well, because a lot of people, when they just think about it, they say, well, they, they committed suicide. Hold on a second. Did they? Some, no doubt about it. No doubt about it. And we know that, right, some were certainly suicide because of the group's writings and the opinions of survivors, which together suggest that members were dying in order to be reborn in a superior state. So here we are again. Now, we believe that too, but not in taking your life. Isn't that a weird line? You, you say, one, once people get to the idea of taking your life in order to fast track your way there, you're, you're going to end up in some weird junk. You have to get into weird junk to get to that place. It says, oh yeah, it's one thing to say, I, if, if martyrdom comes for me, I will gladly accept it, right? And if you can say that, you know, I'd be, I'm one of those that says, look, be hesitant saying it, pray, pray for that kind of grace. Because that would have to be scary. And yet you would pray that you do the right thing. But imagine being like the Circumcellions where you just rush to it. You're like, oh no, 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 I'm so hardcore about it. I want you to do it right now. And then they even get, well, what's more hardcore, doing that to yourself or making somebody else do that? And if they don't, you're going to kill them. <coughs> Which one's more hardcore? Probably the second one, to be quite frank. That seems, that seems even worse. So the Circumcellions might still be the worst in the universe. <laughs> those, are, those are the worst guys. Those are the worst dudes. But not everybody died voluntarily. The initial incident, many of the dead had been shot repeatedly. Some of them were beaten, drugged. Several died with their hands bound. We should be speaking not of mass suicides, but of multiple murder suicides. A Swiss police chief investigating the affair described the theory of mass suicide as, quote, pure cinema. But that's what feeds the press. That's what feeds the press. And why? Because that's the kind of thing that feeds the folks. That's the kind of thing that feeds the folks. People, people are, are attracted, right? Skin and tragedy. That sort of thing attracts quite a crowd. And yet, at the same time, and as the philosopher David Bazan said that in his book called Pedro the Lion, <laughs> right? Skin and tragedy attract a crowd. But the idea is that sort of thing, that's going to that's gonna have legs in media because it's, it's you know, 
Although sensationalism, right? You want something, a, a sensational story, mix it up so it's not just purely suicide, but it's also murder. And yet, it seems as though the primary narrative that had gone out was that it was suicide. And that, that is kind of settled into the imagination. Much like Waco, a lot of people think, oh, it was just committed suicide. No way. No way. Satellite imagery proves this wrong, by the way. But they had some weird connections. The motives for it. What would be the motives? They remain unclear. But we should take account of political and financial factors as well as spiritual. Including, of course, connection to money laundering activities, right-wing terrorism, intelligence movements. Some members were involved in extensive fraud and financial manipulation. So these guys were just straight out criminals. They were just straight out criminal, man. <laughs> it was bad. And what, are the two guys, the two main dudes, have they ever found them, by the way? Have they ever found them? Or are they just kind of roaming around somewhere? We know that in just one recent international arms deal, DeMombro had used the Solar Temple as a front for illegal international transactions amounting to, just guess, <laughs> just guess, 95 million, <laughs> 95 million dollars. Where is that guy? Like right now, $95 million. Maybe that. Maybe that's chump change in the world of international illegal arms deals and stuff. Maybe. Yeah. Unbelievable. So not only is there, are the, all these murder suicides all over the place, but major time crime. One thing that I thought was interesting about this, intelligence movements. What does he mean by that? You know, I because <laughs> you you can't help but to wonder, right? And we got we gotta whisper this. <laughs> we gotta whisper this. I've had I've had intelligence agencies monitor my stuff before. Okay. It's a fact. They've admitted it to my face. So that's not even a thing. But they might be listening. <laughs> and so here's the thing, though, is that a lot of those people end up getting connected with these real radical fringy groups. And a lot of times it's as a provocateur. It's to provoke. We actually see this in a case that was kind of spectacular, actually, involving some political leaders in the United States. That's true. And, and people who said that were mocked and ridiculed and come to find out later, oh my gosh, wow. Oh my gosh, wow. Yet again, look at that. Some kind of alphabet soup agency has its fingerprints all over the place. It happens. For all the uncertainties about the motives for violence, the media immediately branded these groups with the familiar Christian-derived imagery of apocalyptic and millenarian. All were, of course, cults, quote-unquote. After the first solar temple mass death in October 1994, even the outlets that knew of the group's crim criminal, criminal connections leapt to the conclusion that this was, quote, just another Jonestown. It's just another Jonestown. That's all it was. What lazy journalism, by the way. What lazy journalism. What lazy reporting. Is it weird, too, that so often when it comes to cults and scares like that, that we really do trust the media a lot, the people in general do? That's why I'm trying to do my, my journalistic diligence by doing a better job investigating. And, and following books, by the way, it's Oxford University Press. It's an excellent book. Philip Jenkins is an excellent, an excellent scholar. Sources are awesome. He's, he's critical and yet fair, balanced, nuanced. It's true. Once again, this, this is uh, McLean's headline read, Apocalypse Now. While Time announced, quote, 
Once again, mass death in an apocalyptic sect. An episode in cult pathology to put beside Jonestown and Waco. <laughs> Garbage, man. Garbage. Shame on them, by the way. You can do better than that. If I can, they can. They're supposed to be the pros. They're supposed to be the folks going out there changing, changing world events. And the truth is, they are. Sadly. Sadly, people still look to them as authorities. Oh, but it, it even says here, even, even more con, kind of conspiratorial folks, a lot of times they'll advance a certain idea and then they'll say, well, even, even the mainstream media reported on that. Sometimes that's not a good sign, to be frank. As they seem unnecessary, right? As they seemed unnecessary, alternative explanations remained unexplored. So they didn't even explore it. They didn't even look into it. And maligning people, this happens all the time, maligning people who are willing to look at alternative facts. Because that's what that is, by the way. Let, let's demystify that, right? Let, let's redeem that a little bit. Alternative facts would be facts that are not included in the narratives of those who advance narratives. So they may, they, their narrative may have a number of facts, right? It may, in fact, have a number of facts, but it's, it's not all-inclusive. They're choosing certain ones. Kind of like, for example, the, even the idea itself of both sides of the story, it presupposes that there's two sides. That's convenient in a world where we have as our political establishment, Republican and Democrat, right wing and left wing, and you leave it at that, when the main people you're interviewing are politicians and bureaucrats, that makes a lot of sense. But that doesn't mean that the, the best idea available is either one of those two. It's supposed, it's got kind of a weird Hegelian dialectic going on with that. Doesn't it? The suicide stereotype was used to discredit other apocalyptic thinking sets, sects, even those that displayed no violent tendencies. For example, ABC's Nightline discussed the Solar Temple incident in October 1994 in two main commentators. You had uh, these ideas of anti-cult activists Cynthia Kisser and Steve Hassan. So in, we're introducing right now, we're introducing anti-cult activists Cynthia Kisser, Cynthia Kisser and Steve Hassan. And what did they do? They both presented this exceptionally odd group as if it were typical of the cult phenomenon. Hassan even compared the organization to who? Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses? <laughs> we it, Look, there's a lot that people could say about the Jehovah's. I did a number of videos on the Jehovah's Witnesses. You should go check them out. They're really good. However, however, and we'll, be, we'll do more as well. We'll do more from a more strictly presuppositional perspective uh, apologetic, right, than we did before when we were following um, the book Kingdom of the Cults by Walter Martin. But the idea of comparing them to the Jehovah's Witnesses after you just have a bunch of murder suicides, holy cow! Holy cow, man! Looking down at the Kingdom Hall, oh my gosh, I, I think that's like the Solar Temple people. Solar Temple people? Wasn't that like a weird thing involved in like illegal trades of Weapons and junk? Wasn't there like murder-suicide and, and such? Yeah, I think that's going on in the Kingdom Hall right now. What? Are you serious? Similar generalizations were expressed once more. During the 1998 to 99, when the American Concerned Christians sect relocated from Colorado to Israel. And why did they do that? <laughs> Why did they do that? Well, because it was an imminent return, the millennium. Curiously enough, and it's one of those, it's one of those things. It, just think about, just think about this for a second, right? Curiously, this group itself, right, concerned Christians, 
began in the early 1980s as a militant anti-cult movement growing out of an impassioned campaign against the evils of Satanism. So it's satanic panic. So these folks were like heavily involved. They were created as an anti-cult movement to deal with the satanic panic. And what do they do? They end up going over to Israel because they believe the end times is imminent. And when was that? 1998, 1999. Why would that be the case? Oh, I don't know. Because the millennium. You had, you had apocalyptic thinking all around. You had Y2K stuff all around. They were just another example of it. Rumors suggested that the group was plotting acts of violence, but by far the most damning charge against it was that this was a doomsday cult. Think about it. When we use terms like that indiscriminately, this is a self-reflective moment. When we use language, right, and we're not, people get sloppy and they call a group a cult instead of, you know, they're, they're, they're cultic instead of saying that they're enthusiastic. We've, we've reintroduced this idea saying, look, it's a, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very useful term. It's a very useful term because it distinguishes between things. A cult, there's something that actually would be a cult. That's a thing. Same thing with doomsday. If we say doomsday and yet people go, you know how many people use the phrase doomsday cult who, who attend small little chapels in the middle of nowhere exclusively and talk about separating themselves from society to form these little communities because we're living in the end times and they pray the rosary every day? We need to be smarter about that. We're actually using language. It's kind of like a lot of the, the debate when it comes to, you know, the, <clears throat> I think you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> the, <clears throat> ow, that thing. When people started using the language of not only my body, my choice, but also using it and saying, yeah, well, you know, you liberal people, why aren't you being more consistent? I don't think that they fully thought that through. Because then they could turn around and say, oh, so you're consistent now? Uh, well, no, I mean... Uh. They don't understand how this works. They're playing fast and loose with language, using it situationally in the moment, off the cuff, flying by the seat of their pants. It's, the th it's blowback. There's going to be blowback. We're already, we're already seeing it. You're already seeing it. That the anti-cult movement when it's playing fast and loose with language and when it's playing fast and loose with decisions, there's blowback in the same way there's blowback about the way that people view the government. That's not good for the government to make bad decisions, to make hasty decisions that end up in the end being proven wrong and that those deci decisions were based on impressions or ideas and perspectives and perceptions that were fueled themselves by anti-cultists. In the media, disbelief all around. If sex fascinated by ideas of apocalypse were in future to be cast as doomsday cults, then this had consequences for a very wide range of religious bodies, mainly, but not entirely, among Protestant Christians, and not entirely, increasingly so, amongst traditional Catholics. The concept of eminent apocalypse is deeply embedded, right? In fact, many, many words in scripture, in fact, lend the idea of the eminent return, or at least an eminent judgment. Who told believers to separate from an evil world on the eve of destruction. And that we would be condemned by a society in thrall to the forces of evil. Through the right, uh, though the righteous will see their vindication with the violent fall of all earthly structures. Quote, save yourself from this corrupt generation. Now, this is where I won't get into this, but this is where you get in a crazy place where the conversations of futurism or historicism and preterism. I'm a preterist. 
I believe that those things, you know, you save yourself from this corrupt generation. I believe that generation is a real thing. It was an actual generation. This generation will not pass away. Right? Until these things take place. Many people standing here will not taste of death before all of these things take place. I don't think those things were a joke, by the way. I take those things very seriously. And I think that the, the siege and destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, I think that those are extremely significant in our understanding. And that's why I don't use those so much as the future as much as I do as a prophecy that's already been fulfilled. The densest concentration of these texts are found in the language of the book of Revelation in which Christians inhabit a doomed world ruled by the beast and the whore of Babylon who murdered the saints. Christianity may be the oldest extant doomsday cult and it's never lost that strand of belief. After Waco, the ever malleable cult terminology expanded to include apocalyptic or end times beliefs of the sort held by tens of millions of American believers, many of whom share the Davidian expectation that Christians would, in the last days, have to take up literal rather than spiritual arms to resist the Antichrist. Have you ever, I'm assuming there's a lot of um, reactionaries who watch the show, <laughs> you know, how many times have you been in a private conversation? Be honest with yourself, right? Don't put it in the chat. Don't put it in the chat. This is a spicy episode. Don't do it, okay? Be careful. But how many people, thinking quietly, be honest. How many people in your heart, as you were talking to individuals, talked about the very real possibility that it's going to very soon possibly require and because of Antichrist, because the beast. How many different beasts have, have you believed in or have you heard pitched to you since you've been born? How many different things as it cycles, barcodes, www, va, 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 666, Russia, China, Iran. How many different... Explanations. Rome. Rome. Set of a contest. Not just Sedes, man. Straight up crypto Sedes. A whole bunch of people in the r and &R movement. Totally believe that. Possible. The NWO is coming for you, those NW Ordites. And look, that may very well be true. In fact, it increasingly seems this way. There is credibility to this idea. It's not that it's just pulled out of thin air. They're not saying this during the time of, of you know, a day and age, a golden era of Catholicism. They're not speaking triumphalistically. They're speaking in a day and age when apostasy is all around, wicked nonsense all around, prelates doing wild, crazy, terrible things, the most damnedest things in the world, damnable. In the whole universe. On display. In your face. But yet, how many of us, when describing a doomsday cult, had some of this imagery in our mind regarding that group? Separatistic. Separating themselves from society. Forming little communities, platoons. Training themselves. All that stuff. That it was imminent. That it was the end of the world. That the government was the problem. That the church was the problem. All these other things. Those groups that believed that when we talked about them, did we set ourselves up for some serious blowback? Blowback being a technical term used in, in the intelligence community talking about I, uh, for example, in like war theory and stuff, when, when we talk about blowback being, we had a certain policy, you go to a specific place and you, there's un, unforeseen consequences. You did not anticipate this. You could probably 
think that through, but you can't anticipate the fallout. Well, you know, uh, for example, when when you go and you say, "Well, we're going to drone. We're going to we're going to bomb people with drones." Okay? And we're going to go in and we're going to try to have these really targeted bombings. These drone attacks. And and we see and we talk about the precision, the camera as it goes down. It's kind of a fascinating thing to watch. Sometimes it hits precisely the absolute worst target in the world. <laughs> but it was precise. The intelligence wasn't, though. And the entire family dies. Sometimes at a wedding party. Sometimes with tons of children. The remaining friends and family, people who attend the mosque that they attend, people who are involved in in radical religious and political groups trying to, to recruit them for a long time. Do you think that that is going to leave an impression deep-rooted that is going to cause blowback. Yeah, totally. Totally. It's just true. There's a great book about it, by the way. It's one of those that Ron Paul, I think it was, was he talking to Rudy Giuliani? Saying Rudy, Rudy Giuliani needed to educate himself. One of those books was, uh, was entitled Blowback. And I think that this is one of those things that that's why we need to be careful. That's why we need to think through it a little bit more. Why we need to not rely upon a media, you know, that, that constantly say things with hardly any kind of repercussion whatsoever. They literally are getting away with, with murder in that sense. Or for real, murder in that sense. And I don't want to be part of that, by the way. And people who tune into this show, I'm, I do my absolute best, my very best, <laughs> my very best, to, to make sure that we aren't going to fall prey to that sort of thing, that we're at least thinking those things through when we talk about other groups or make decisions even for ourselves. Because we are left with this extremely volatile ground for blowback. We're already experiencing it now. And we have to say, if we react a certain way, that also will have unintended consequences. So do better, think better, speak better, behave better. A tradition, therefore, became cultish, not by evolving new or radical religious interpretations, but by retaining ideas, retaining, that would have seemed quite orthodox to most generations throughout American history. Yeah. So we got to be careful. We've got to be careful. Ah, I love this show. I'm super glad that we got to hang out. I hope you enjoyed yourself, by the way. Make sure to go over right now and check out the book club. They're going through uh, C.S. Lewis, Mere Christianity, and the Wolfpack Prayer Chain. I'm going to be doing more on that prayer chain. We're going to be doing a lot more on there. And I'm going to start posting just like other people, just like those faithful souls that go in there and, and let everybody know, I prayed for the Wolfpack today. I'm super grateful for all of you. And I'm going to join you. We're going to do this. Right? We're going to have a great time, but make sure you go over there and check out the links in the description below. If you love the show, please like it. And if you if you watch the show and you're in the chat, also make sure to comment. Let people know that you had a fun time in the live chat and that you'd like more people to participate. It's a really good time. And of course, if you go on Telegram, which is linked in the description below, really easy, T, the letter T, dot, me, just M-E slash the Wolfpack chat. Totally free. If you go in there, it will connect you with a whole bunch of stuff, including the Fat Shame to Fitness crusade that I'm on, which is awesome. I don't know if you've noticed this. Check it out. I'm looking good. Looking good. Lost a whole bunch of weight. Had to throw away tons of clothes. You'll be connected with all of that. And you'd be able to reach out to me in a DM, video chat, voice chat, live chat in the Wolfpack, all of it. Of course, visit us at Patreon. And if you want to join us with the Saint Maker, 
and examine your life and organizing it with the wisdom uh, that comes through philosophy and time, the science of these things and the saints, check out the link in the description below. It helps the show. Pray for us. Until next time, never give up. Keep on smiling and momentum more. I wanted to make people dream bigger thoughts.